Well, I was, I was born in um, Manchester, England, one of the suburbs, on the day that Hitler marched into Czechoslovakia. And uh, the war, World War II, started six months later. And so my earliest childhood memories were of the, the black curtains that we put up around the house and uh, the bombs dropping on Manchester and the fires that followed. Those are my earliest, earliest memories. And they included a, a makeshift bomb shelter that we had in the middle of the house because the nearest bomb shelter was quite a long walk for what were then basically two babies, two toddlers, my older sister and myself. And so uh, that was in a, a pantry in the middle of the house. And I can remember the end of the war. Actually, before the end of the war, I remember my aunt saying, and I must have been about three at the time, when Winston Churchill had just been made prime minister, we'll be all right now. And that really brings me to the, one of the most influential people in my life, my father's sister, who we just called Auntie. And uh, she was a very cultured woman. She was a teacher. And after the war, um, probably I was about, I was six when the war ended. And this was probably when I was seven, maybe eight. Uh, my aunt took my sister and myself to the newly opened Manchester Art Gallery. And I don't remember any of the pictures except one. And that was a picture um, that was a, a drawing, probably a charcoal drawing with a green wash done by Barbara Hepworth. Barbara Hepworth was actually a sculptress and a very good one, a very famous one. But she, she did this drawing and it was just labeled theater, which is the English word for operating room. And the, there were about three males in the picture and one female, who was obviously the nurse. And apparently, I was told later on, I just stood st staring at it. And I remember that it influenced me. I had a male teacher who, uh, for some reason, was in a class where it was a sewing class, and I was sewing. And he said to me, Catherine Duncan, that was my name before it became Anderson, you would be very good in domestic science as a career. <laughs> And I think I just glared at him. In those days, one couldn't, I had, I had, my parents had no money. So I couldn't just pay to go to medical school. I had to get a scholarship. And so I spent the next year in high school, applied to Oxford and Cambridge, and got into Cambridge, and met there a woman physician named Dorothy Hurd. We had two sets of tutors. One was a director of studies who was in charge of all the studies that we did. And then we had tutors in anatomy and the, the basic parts of medical school. And Dorothy Hurd was a widow with two children. And she tried to tell me that I may not be able to be a surgeon because I was the wrong gender. And she said, you may find yourself doing something that you didn't set out to do. And I just determined that I was going to do what I had set out to do. I developed my interest in pediatric surgery really from an interest in children. Um, we never had any children of our own. And uh, I knew I wanted to do surgery, but I just found that the combination of pediatric patients and surgery was the most fascinating. During medical school, I, um, I was shy. Everybody laughs when I tell them that. 
Uh, but I was. And uh, the dean of students called me one day and he said, I've heard you want to be a surgeon. Well, you're too shy. And you can't apply for a, a surgical internship. He said, in fact, I will block it. And so I understood that I couldn't go. I couldn't get past this man. So I applied for a pediatric internship and spent a year in pediatrics at Boston Children's, which was an absolutely wonderful year. And if I'd had any doubts at all about pediatric surgery, they were uh, what waved away by that year. It was an absolutely marvelous year. But he was very influential in my life. Hardy Hendren was a hero. He was everybody's hero and continued to be beyond his own retirement. I was looking for a pediatric surgical training program that would take me. And the only one, my husband was at NIH. We had no plans to move from Washington, the Washington area. And I needed a residency at Washington DC Children's Hospital, which was headed by Judson Randolph. And that is, Judd Randolph was another hero of mine he was a young faculty member at the Boston Children's Hospital when I was a medical student. And we would have a pediatric surgery lecture on a Friday afternoon where most medical students were asleep. And Judd Randolph could keep us all awake. So I wanted to train with Judd Randolph. But he really didn't want to train me until he had a gap in his program. There was nothing formal like we have now, where there's a match and you go around on interviews. I would walk up to Children's Hospital from Georgetown, where I did my surgical residency, and I would ask him if he would train me. And he eventually said yes. My name is Dr. Larry Hill. J. Lawrence Hill in a more formal style. And uh, I was approached about talking uh, and discussing Kathy Anderson, Catherine Anderson, with whom I worked uh, actually as a trainee to begin with. And that's interesting how it came about. Um, I was in Vietnam commanding a surgical unit. And uh, as it turned out, Rather than just being there 10 months, as most surgeons were, I uh, they couldn't get a, someone to, I was commanding a surgical unit, and they couldn't get anyone to take my place. So I was there for over a year. Dr. Randolph was in Washington, uh, was one of the first pediatric surgeons in the Middle Atlantic area, in fact. And uh, he had been introduced to Katherine Anderson, who had expressed a desire to train in pediatric surgery but he had several of us already lined up to uh, train for the next few years when I had called and told him that I was going to be delayed in Vietnam. And so he called Dr. Anderson up and offered the job to her in my absence. And that worked out very well. When I went back to Washington to do my training in Pete surgery, Dr. Anderson was al already selected to be on the faculty there, and I got to meet her. And indeed, uh, she was a very charming, very bright, uh, very positive, uh, diligent, had a great sense of humor. Uh, she was a wonderful comrade to train under. I can't say anything more positive uh, when talking about Dr. Anderson because she was just superb and a wonderful comrade uh, a wonderful colleague in surgery. I developed a particular interest in, 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 during my pediatric surgery fellowship in esophageal surgery. At the time, we had a lot of children who were drinking lye. It was just after a law that had mandated um, childproof caps on lye, bottles of lye. And most um, companies were not paying any attention to that law. 
And a lot of um, parents, unfortunately, would put toxic substances into Coke bottles. And children don't, don't sip and taste something. They just swallow it down. So we had a lot of children with lye burns to the esophagus. And Judd Randolph taught me how to replace the esophagus when it was necessary with a piece of the colon. And I didn't like that organ in place of the esophagus. Uh, so I got interested in replacing it with um, a reverse gastric tube. And that became my thing, became the thing I was known for, became the procedure that I love to um, love to do. And I tried to advance as the surgical science advanced. And I did not stay on at Children's. I went back to Georgetown to do pediatric surgery there. And um, contrary to my expectations, I was not welcome there because the chief of surgery at the time, who had trained me in general surgery, excellent Mayo Clinic trained surgeon, but a real curmudgeon, he said, all you need are small sutures. And um, I just did, was not happy there. He was no longer the chief when I went back. Uh, Charles Huffnagel was, the very famous cardiac surgeon, real pioneer. But uh, he did not let me do any thoracic procedures. And uh, I was trained in that as a pediatric surgeon. So after two years, an opportunity arose in children's just up the road, and I went back and stayed there until I moved to Los Angeles. Well, as, as, um, as a fellow, I was taught by, uh, besides Judd Randolph, I was taught by three superb pediatric surgeons. John Lilly, who pioneered the operation of biliary treasure in this country. Uh, Peter Altman, who was the complete pediatric surgeon and Bill Tunnell. And uh, Peter and I were probably the, the best team that I encountered as a surgical resident, both in general and in pediatric surgery. And um, he was just a superb pediatric surgeon. And we didn't ever talk during surgery. We knew what the other one was doing and going to do. And it was, it was just wonderful. Another um, special relationship that um, Dr. Anderson developed was she knew that um, a good operation was never good enough, particularly in the neonates. She wanted it to be perfect and we never left the operating room unless the operation was absolutely perfect in her opinion. She and I developed a very special relationship in that uh, when we got to a point where we were dealing with a difficult situation or a difficult case, uh, we would come to the same conclusion about what the next step was. It got to the point where frequently Dr. Anderson could finish my sentences before I finished them and I could do the same with her. So Dr. Anderson has meant a great deal to me as a mentor and a friend and I'm delighted that she's uh, been selected for this uh, video on icons of surgery. Well, I wanted to be a surgeon in chief to begin with. And uh, I thought that Los Angeles training program was a sleeper program. I was very interested in teaching and much more interested in teaching somebody how to do surgery than doing it myself, as a matter of fact. And I saw a lot of opportunities in Los Angeles to develop what was a good clinical program with enormous volume and breadth of cases into one of the best training programs in the country. That was my major ambition coming to Los Angeles. Kathy Anderson provided skilled support both in and out of the OR to so many young surgeons. 
and I think that is in many ways her legacy. She was probably one of the finest teachers there is, and I know it was her most important contribution uh, and legacy. On arriving in Los Angeles, uh, Kathy came into an environment which was both an academic environment as well as a private practice environment. And I know it was very important to her to really maintain that and actually develop the relationships between all those people to make sure that we had the strongest training program possible. And this is something that she carried on into her presidencies of both APSA and the American College of Surgeons. I became involved with the, uh, with the societies uh, in both pediatric and adult surgery. I was very interested in the college and I uh, was um, very interested in the American Academy of Pediatrics and the surgical section. I can't remember the year that um, I became chair of the surgical section, um, but I was secretary first. So that was part of my career that was developed later rather than, than sooner. I became chair. And then I had the opportunity to replace Dr. Hendren as a governor to the American College of Surgeons. So I basically had two parallel tracks, general surgery and pediatric surgery. And uh, I became a member of APSA, American Pediatric Surgical Association, and became secretary, I think, I can't remember the year now. I'm getting se more senior moments these days. Um, but uh, I was secretary of uh, APSA for a um, full term. I was a governor of the American College of Surgeons, and when I was finishing my governorship at the American College of Surgeons, I was invited to be the secretary of the American College of Surgeons. And so I was that for nine years. I never really particularly wanted to make a mark in the surgical world one way or another. Basically, I wanted to do what I wanted to do, which had been characteristic of my entire life. But I found myself being the first something, the first woman something, the first secretary of the surgical section in the American Academy of Pediatrics, the first chair of the surgical section, the first female secretary of APSA, first pres female president of APSA. The first, I was not, certainly not the first governor of the college. Women uh, had been governors of the American College of Surgeons for a long, long time. Um, but I was the first pediatric surgeon to do that first woman pediatric surgeon, certainly the first woman secretary, and then later the first woman president of the American College of Surgeons. It wasn't something that I, I didn't set my sights. As a surgical resident, I set my sights on getting through each rotation. And I'm not really a person to go over past things that happened, but there was a lot of prejudice in the early days against surgery. Surgical women, there still is, but a lot of those barriers have been broken. I found myself breaking those barriers without really meaning to, just in doing what I wanted to do with my life. So I guess I was a trailblazer, but it's, a, it's accumulation. When you when you see when you talk to a true athlete, a true trailblazer, a true leader, they say it wasn't just me; it was the team, and and I feel that very very strongly. The care of children has improved tremendously by the development and now the maturity of pediatric surgery as a specialty. I'm sure that the pediatricians had the same fight when they tried to break away from the general practitioners. I would say to people, do what you want to do, 
but try not to do it all at once. Start with baby steps and go to the next. And then, because you'll change on the way and you might take deviations. But do the next step and then the next step and do what you feel happy doing, what you feel comfortable about doing. Did I leave anything unfulfilled? No, I don't think I did. What I wanted to do was be a good surgeon, be a good teacher, and have people regret when I retired. And I wanted to retire before people said, well, you have to help the old girl out in the operating room. And so I retired when I felt like I was possibly be at my best. And that was the right time. Don't know. I don't have any regrets.